This evening's reading is from Matthew 13, verses 1 to 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got in a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he, as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen, to, listen then to what the, the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. This is the word of the Lord. Good evening again. It will be useful to keep your Bibles open in Matthew chapter 13. That's where we're spending our time this evening. Now, I grew up in Durban, uh, which is a long, long way away, a very long time ago. And after I finished school, I then attended UCT way back in 1991. Oh, that was a long time ago. I studied, I was a science student, and I studied zoology. That was my major. I've always been fascinated by nature. I always want to cut things open and see how they work, you know, because it is fascinating. Because God has designed things to work in specific ways. For example, in the world of insects, many have developed a way of pretending to be something that they are not. That is, for the sake of their own safety, they want to stay alive, they want to fool predators. That particular thing is called mimicry, which is a little bit different. See, mimicry isn't exactly camouflage. They're not trying to blend into their surroundings like a chameleon. That would be camouflage. But instead, mimicry is, is when you're trying to look like something else. You're trying to look like a different animal, a different insect. So, for example, there are a number of harmless snakes. But they're very similar in color to the very poisonous snakes. So when you look at them, you're actually not sure what they are, so you just stay away. See, that is mimicry. Now, friends, as we look at our parable this evening... One thing you are going to be challenged with this evening is to have a look at yourself and decide who you are. We will see that those who call themselves Christians are not just to look like Christians on the outside. That's not the core. But they also must produce fruit in keeping with their, with their confession as Christians. So why don't you pray with me? Father, we do thank you that we can meet together this evening. Would you please give us ears to hear what you have to say? And we ask this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Now, many of you would have heard about parables before. You know, parables are a very short, descriptive story. It's usually designed to communicate a single truth or answer a single question. That is normal. What that means is that not all the details in the parable are, will necessarily have their counterparts. You know, so we don't have to worry about all the details unless we are told. What we need to do with parables is work at understanding what the big idea is. What is the point that Jesus is trying to make? An allegory, on the other hand, is a little different. It's a more elaborate story in which most of all of the details do have their counterparts in the application. But this evening, understand, we are not busy with allegory. We are busy with parable. And we must understand that distinction. So when we get to the parable itself, unless we are told the detail, we're going to ignore it because we want to know what is the main thing. What is Jesus really on about? And I've chosen the parable of the sower this evening, which is a very well-known parable if you spend any time in a church. This is a parable from the farming world. A sower sowed seed. The seed falls on various kinds of soils with different results in each case. However, when you look at it, there are only two real results. Did you notice it? Either the seed produces fruit or the seed dies. Those are ultimately what happens. Either the evidence that you're a believer is there or you're not a believer. It doesn't matter how much you say you are a believer. It doesn't matter how much you attend church, Bible study, whatever it is. If the evidence is not there, it is not true. Have a look at verses 18 to 23, which is the explanation of the parable. Because now you've learned the parable. It's wonderful when, when, when the Bible already preaches my sermon for me, right? I don't have to work out what it means. It's a wonderful passage. I can't get it wrong. It's wonderful. Have a look at verse 18. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. Well, the one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. There are a few things we're going to learn this evening. The first thing, is that not everyone who hears the message of the kingdom will receive it. Not everyone who hears will receive. My father, um, who died a long time ago now when I was 21, he had a heart attack when he was 45. He had water on his lungs, which was largely due to his smoking, according to the doctors. The cardiologist said to him, if you smoke again, it will kill you. That's what they told him. After not being able to quit for as many times as he tried, can I tell you what? He quit immediately. <laughs> There's nothing like a life or death situation to motivate you to do something that's good for you, isn't it? However, less than two years later, there came a time when he started to doubt the doctor's words. And he really believed that ah, smoking is not such a big deal. So he started smoking again. And when he did... He had a second heart attack at age 47 and died. My dad, as foolish as he was, at least he was consistent. He acted on what he believed to be true. That's what he did. Have a look at verse 19. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. As we're going to discover in this parable that God calls us to act on what we believe to be true. We have to. The path represents the person who, who hears the message about the kingdom. They hear it like you are listening this evening. It may be that they went to church. Maybe that they heard that the preacher tell them about this man called Jesus, who was the son of God. 
telling us that the same man then died on a cross to take their place, to take your place, to take the punishment that you deserve for your sin. Because we are sinners, we just heard it in Carl's testimony. They have heard that forgiveness can only be found in Jesus, which is the message of the kingdom. It could be that a friend told them this news, or it could be that they heard it at a confirmation service like this one. Yet they choose not to believe. As they hear it, the evil one snatches it away. You know the saying, in one ear, out the other. That's what's happening with the first one. Maybe I'm describing you this evening. You've heard about Jesus. You've heard about the message of the kingdom. Maybe you've heard it from friends. Maybe from family. Maybe from your own children, your neighbors, wherever you've heard it, and you still refuse to believe the gospel of God. If that's you, friend, then you have rejected the message of the kingdom. You are soil number one to the path. Secondly, we learn that some who hear the message of the kingdom, they look like believers, but over time they're shown to be false. Have you ever met people in your life? I suppose if you've lived long enough, you have, right? If you haven't yet, then you're probably still very young. Where they say to you, well, I've tried the whole Christian thing, you know, but it just didn't work for me. Maybe you've heard that before. Maybe you know of people who used to be such strong Christians, you know, always around, Bible study, serving here, doing this, going on evangelism, course, whatever it is. And now when you talk to them, it's like they've turned their back on Jesus and the gospel and they no longer believe. I was a biologist, I probably would call that mimicry. Pretending to be something that you are not. I've seen men and women over the years being so in love with Jesus, so on fire for him. And now there's just nothing. There's no life. Over the years, they, they've grown cold. Jesus doesn't seem to excite them as much as he did when they first believed the gospel. And when they do come to church, while they're bored, why must we hear the same thing over and over again, right? Why must we hear the gospel? We know that. Tell us something new. Tell us something fresh. Tell us something that's going to challenge us. We don't need to hear that old thing again. And they also just refuse to have a regular quiet time with God, spending time in the Bible saying, well, that's just legalism. But when you first got to know Jesus, oh, didn't you love reading the Bible? Didn't you love spending time with him? Growing in your love for him? What's happened? They've now lost interest in God and his word. The world has gained a greater pull on their lives. Maybe I am describing you this evening. Listen to verse 20. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. It looks like someone who's heard the message of the kingdom. It looks like someone who's believed the message of the kingdom. They have believed that Jesus died to save them. But there's no root. And one of the reasons they haven't understood how valuable God's kingdom is. There's no root. And when they are persecuted because of what they believe, the guardian to the world say, yes, I've become a Christian. Well, don't be stupid. <laughs> Did you have to check your brains in at the door? How could you believe such a ridiculous story? They quickly give it up. Persecution comes in many forms. It can come in the form of social pressure from friends. It could come in the form of, you know, people used to invite me to things, now they don't anymore because I'm a Christian. They think I can't have any fun anymore. Now there's pressure to keep on doing what you used to do. Even though you know it involves a changed lifestyle, you're going, well, if I only just pleased them, then I'd still have my friends. He knows where that path leads. And yet, while wanting to please God, struggles 
because you don't also want to lose your friends. You might resist for a while, but then for fear of losing out, succumb to temptation. It's much easier if you don't have a conscience, right? So then give up on God so I can do whatever I want. That's what happens. No root lasts a very short time. Friends, short is such a relative word, isn't it? But in the context of eternity, (laughs) this life is so short, isn't it? Verse 22. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. Again, it sounds like someone who's believed the gospel, right? It sounds like someone who had embraced Jesus, yet produces no fruit. The implication of the story is that the plant ultimately dies because of the worries of this life. That takes over. The deceitfulness of wealth choke the person. These are people who might think, oh, I've got so many problems. If only I had more money, I'll be okay, right? Well, I could be just a little bit more comfortable. How much do you want? Just a little bit more than what I have. Doesn't matter who you ask that question to, it'll always be a little bit more than what I have, isn't it? Thinking that more money will make problems go away. Sure. If only that were true. You chase after money, what you discover is that you might be a little bit more comfortable, but the question is, what is the cost? Well, you're putting longer hours in at the office, so you don't have time to spend with God, do you? You're just too tired at the end of the day. You work long days and long hours. And because you're putting in the extra hours, you can't guarantee that you'll be here on a Sunday. So you can't actually serve God's people. There's no guarantee you're going to be here. With all the extra time, you know, your, your schedule is unpredictable. And the Christian friends you used to hang out with, well, you don't see them as much because you're hanging out at the office so often, chasing after the money. You had no time to invest in those friends anymore. In the end, you start walking away from Jesus. The deceitfulness of wealth will choke you. Friends, this parable teaches us that they never truly understood or believed the message of the kingdom. For time, they looked like they believed. They really did. But over time, they've shown themselves to be false. I don't know everybody here this evening. So I can say lots of things and walk away and leave it with notes, right? But can I ask you, are you heading down that road? Have you started that journey away from Jesus? Friends, don't fall for it. Don't let the worries of this life, don't let the deceitfulness of wealth, which promises so much, it will never deliver. Don't let those things take you away from Jesus who gave his life for you. So if you are not a believer, you are soil number one. God calls you this evening to believe the message of the kingdom. The message is you can only find forgiveness in Jesus. You need to come to him and repent of your sin and ask for his forgiveness. Will you do that this evening or is it going to be just another week? in one ear, out the next. And if you say you are a believer, let me ask you a different question. How do you know for sure that you are a believer? Have you ever thought about that? I'm a, I say I'm a Christian, but how do I know I'm a Christian? How do I know that I'm not just playing Christian? See? How do I know I'm just not mimicking what Christians do? Am I truly, truly a believer? Do I really, really love Jesus? How do you know you're not soil number two or soil number three? It's looking good for a while, but falling away. Well, Jesus tells us, doesn't he? He says, true believers produce fruit. True believers produce fruit. Have a look at verse 23. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. See, the good soil, friends, is the believer. The good soil is the Jesus follower. It's the person who not only hears the word, 
but then understands it. And as they understand the word, as you understand the message of the kingdom, so you produce fruit. Now, this parable doesn't tell us what that fruit is. Did you notice? It just said you will produce fruit. You might be thinking, well, what is that fruit? Well, I'm glad you're thinking that. Because it's very important to know what that is, if you know that, to know that you're a real Christian. Can I suggest you read the rest of Matthew's gospel? Because they'll tell you. Later in Matthew, we read that the fruit of the kingdom is, is recognizing Jesus, that he is Lord and Savior. It is submitting yourself to him as the only appropriate response. What that means is letting Jesus be the boss of you and you not the boss of him. And maybe your children have asked you and you've said, do this, you go, are you the boss of me? Well, yes, I am. I'm your father, okay? Jesus needs to be the boss of you. He needs to tell you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, and for how long to do it. It means that Jesus is your boss. Practically, well, how we conduct our relationships, whether it's friendships or romantic friendships, that also needs to be informed by what Jesus says, isn't it? How we use our leisure time needs to be informed by Jesus. How we spend our money, how we treat our employers or employees if we own a business has to be informed by the message of the kingdom. There is no area of our lives where Jesus does not rule, where Jesus is not first. Can't be second, third, fourth. That doesn't count. If he's anywhere there, friends, you are not a Christian. Jesus has to be number one. So finally, Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Have a look at verse 9. He who has ears, let him hear. <laughs> the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to people in parables? You ever, ever wondered about that? Why did Jesus speak in parables? Again, we assume it's to make things clearer, don't we? It's wonderful when Jesus actually tells us the answer, then we don't have to guess. Have a look at verse 11. Jesus replied, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and I will heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see but did not see it, and hear what you hear but did not hear it. You, know, you hear what Jesus is saying? The reason he speaks to parables, because the disciples didn't understand why he's speaking in parables. So Jesus says, let me tell you, I speak in parables because the secrets of the kingdom of God have only been given to a few. They're given to the disciples, not to everyone. Actually, as we read, we see the, king, the secret of the kingdom of God. Well, well, that's been given to anyone who has ears to hear. Verse 12, for those who can hear, more understanding will be given. So the hearer will then have an abundance of God's word. For those who reject this message of the kingdom, even the little knowledge that they might have, even that will be taken away. Now today... Noah and Carl have taken a stand for Jesus, haven't they? They have declared in front of God and in front of us, their family, that they love Jesus, that they want to obey Jesus, and that Jesus is number one before mom and dad. They're committing themselves to growing in the gospel, to serving the church of God. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? And yet so many young people today just will not do it. And not, not just the younger people, also so many older folk will not do it. But more among the young, I hear this. I want to enjoy my life, right? 
and I'll decide for Jesus later. As if being a Christian is not enjoyable. What do they know? They think that Jesus is actually there to, to spoil their fun. But friends, it doesn't work that way. Only if you have ears to hear will you hear. If you continue to reject God's word, there might come a time when God takes it away from you. In other words, it might be in 20 years' time you go, well, now I'm ready, and, but you actually don't have ears to hear anymore. Because God has removed his word from you. And even though you might want to or think you want to repent and come to Jesus, you will not be able to. Because God will take away the word from you. And your heart will become calloused. And you will reject him. Again at verse 16 to 17. The disciples on the other hand are very blessed, aren't they? They are blessed because they see. They are blessed because they hear and understand. They are blessed because of these things. They have literally, think about this, if you lived at the right time in history, you would have literally seen God in the person of Jesus. Can you just imagine that for a moment? You would have seen God. Wow. You would have heard God speak as Jesus is teaching them in parables. This is God speaking. The disciples were truly blessed, weren't they? And the disciples were also in a privileged position. Because we are told there were many prophets before them, many righteous men before them who were waiting for this Messiah to come. They looked forward to that and yet they died before they actually got to see Jesus in the flesh. The disciples, on the other hand, shock, they're living the dream, aren't they? They were looking forward to it. And here they are experiencing God in the flesh. They are seeing God's plan to save them unfold in the person of Jesus himself. And they have written down what they have heard. They have written down what they have seen and encourage us to believe the same things that they did. Friends, as we believe the message, so we bring ourselves under the rule of Jesus and we produce fruit in keeping with that repentance. Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Will you pray with me? Father, we do thank you for speaking to us and revealing the secrets of the kingdom to us. Help those of us who see and hear to produce fruit in keeping with our repentance as the evidence that we love you and you alone. For the rest, Lord, Please give them eyes to see, give them ears to hear, and give them hearts to understand. And we ask this in Jesus' name.